uh, maybe I'll take the liberty here of introducing uh, Dr. Julia Pribble, who will be our um, first Butler Polymer Research Laboratory webinar uh, speaker. Um, hopefully not the last. We already have a couple of other um, presentations that are lined up, so more details on that to, uh, to come soon. Um, we have had a, a history, of course, of doing presentations via or, or as part of the Butler Laboratory for many years. And uh, I think it behooves us to just keep in mind uh, where the Butler Lab started. Uh, and that was really from uh, the late George and Josephine Butlers, um, both of whom um, really contributed greatly to starting this polymer effort uh, at the University of Florida that's really flourished now and, and grown into uh, quite a significant effort over the, over the years. Um, the, uh, the Butler Lab, uh, here's a picture from um, last fall where we had another meeting where, or, or last spring actually, uh, where we had an, another meeting with a few uh, outside speakers coming to us from around the world. Um, so this is um, some fraction of the Butler Laboratory. We're roughly um, 80, 80 to 100 people, let's say, depending on the, the time of the year, really, um, all within the Department of Chemistry uh, from eight different research groups, uh, the names of which are, are shown here. Um, soon to be uh, nine different research groups with our newest member uh, joining us um, in the, the spring, which will be uh, Eddie Benetti from uh, ETH will be joining us as a new faculty member um, in January of 2021. Um, but uh, this webinar series, we hope, will be part of uh, a continuing thing that we do um, where we will involve speakers both from within the Butler Laboratory, but also guest speakers. Um, so some of you that are listening online may be approached uh, in the future to see your willingness perhaps to, uh, to contribute to this. Um, I, I will ask uh, just as a, a point of um, logistics here, I, I think everyone's muted, but if you're not, please do make sure to mute yourself. Um, and we will, I think, try to hold questions till the end. Um, and at the end, there is a way to, uh, to raise your hand if you're not familiar with it. I think everyone is probably pretty Zoom literate these days, but um, if you're not familiar with it, at the bottom of your screen, you can click on um, participants and uh, then you have a way to, uh, to raise your hand. So, um, and then I'll try to recognize people and, um, and call on you um, at the end of this. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I will just give the floor over to uh, Dr. Pribble, who's a member of the Wagoner Research Group, and uh, she will tell you about ADMET. All right. Thanks, Dr. Summerlin. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. It's really um, pretty exciting that we can uh, invite a lot of people that are outside of the Butler Lab. So today, I want to give you a pretty general overview of um, some history and also the state of the art of ADMET polymerization. Um, I want to talk about metathesis to begin. So there's actually a lot of different types of metathesis. Um, most of us in the Butler Lab are probably more familiar with organic chemistry, but there's a lot of different types of metathesis according to IUPAC. Um, probably the most famous of which that's not really organic reaction is salt metathesis, which we more often call ion exchange chemistry. And then of course there's carbonyl olefin metathesis, alkyne metathesis, uh, but the core of the chemistry that I'm gonna be discussing today revolves around olefin metathesis, which is in the box there. Um, I want to begin by some talking about some olefin metathesis history. So I think we all are aware that we're now at the 100th anniversary of when Hermann Staudinger published his macromolecular hypothesis in 1920. And not long after that hypothesis, uh, metathesis chem chemistry began, um, but the scientists conducting it didn't necessarily know it at the time. So in the 1950s, um, metathesis chemistry was attempted with really poorly defined catalysts, uh, mostly comprised of high, oxida high oxidation metal salts with activating agents. And then in the 1960s, um, scientists at DuPont noticed that when they would put these kind of ill-defined catalyst mixtures into a solution of norbornene, they would get stereospecific pentane rings linked by trans double bonds. And at the time, they theorized that this was the result of a catalytic coordination mechanism. And they were correct, um, but they didn't know exactly how that mechanism worked. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, Chauvin published his metathesis mechanism, which included a metallocyclobutane intermediate. Um, and that was actually proven to be the correct mechanism. And that's the mechanism that we accept today. Um, 
Then if we move into the 1980s and 1990s, we have the arrival of the first spectroscopically well-defined Schrock and Grebs catalysts. Um, Schrock catalysts generally have a molybdenum or tungsten metal center, whereas Grebs catalysts have a ruthenium center. Um, and then they have all sorts of different ligands that they've put on these uh, different catalyst systems to try to tune the reactivity. And then in 1991, which is where, um, where I'm going to start picking up, is uh, efficient admet polymerization was reported by the Wagner Group um, in the early 90s. And the, the citation here is one of the, the first highly cited citations. And then um, proudly, as we all know, in 2005, uh, Professor Grubbs, Professor Schrock, and Professor Chauvin were all jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their contributions to metabolism chemistry. All right, so I want to do a little bit of a refresher, um, especially for um, anyone who hasn't really thought about the basics of polymer chemistry in a while um, and talk a little bit about what it means to be a step growth uh, type of polymerization. So ADMA is a step growth polycondensation polymerization, and that means that there's certain molecular weight characteristics that we need to keep in mind. So in step growth polymerizations, um, you get high degrees of polymerization only at very high reaction conversions. Um, I have a little illustration to demonstrate this concept. So imagine that we have 10 molecules of an AA type monomer and 10 molecules of a BB type monomer and A and B react together to form um, a reaction that forms a, a bond. So a 20% conversion, which is denoted the, the reactions between A's and B's denoted by the yellow bonds here, we have an average degree of polymerization of 1.25. Um, so as we go a little bit higher in conversion to 65%, not much increase in the degree of polymerization um, at about 2.8. So it's only when we get to 95% conversion above do we start to see um, what we would consider to be a true polymer, not you know small molecular weight oligomers. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, this is true to perform a successful admet polymerization that you take the reaction to very high reaction conversion. Um, this relationship between reaction conversion and degree of polymerization is incorporated into the Carruthers equation, which is in this box here. Um, and we can also say something about the dispersity of what, what dispersity we would expect from a step growth polymerization. Um, we can derive the most probable molecular weight distribution using the flory schultz distribution, um, which is how you derive this term here. And it simplifies to dispersity equals one plus P. So as the reaction conversion approaches 100%, the dispersity value will, will approach two. And in this picture here, I have Walt Carruthers, who um, his namesake equation is on this slide, stretching a piece of neoprene rubber um, back in 1930. So now I'll move on to um, the ADMET reaction. So this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. And at its core, it's an approach to preparing precision functional group spacing um, polymers. So we start by combining an alpha omega diene monomer with um, the R group can be almost countless things, and we're going to talk about a few of them in this presentation. And you put that with a metathesis catalyst, and what you get uh, is an admet polymer, which has an internal olefin that we can remove later on or keep, depending on what we're interested in, and um, gaseous ethylene are the two products. So the way that this works, uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the mechanism. So we start with a, a metal uh, transition metal uh, coordinated to uh, benzyl or uh, an alkylidine species. And the, the way that it enters the catalytic mechanism is it first coordinates or ligates um, a monomer, in this case, an alpha omega diene monomer, forming the metallocyclobutane uh, intermediate. And then once this alkylidine ligand leaves, it enters the catalytic cycle. So then at this point, another molecule of monomer can coordinate to form another metallic cyclobutane ring, and then at this point we generate a dimer. And then our metal catalyst is coordinated to methylene group. And then finally, after one more coordination of monomer, we get scission of a molecule of ethylene, which it leaves, it, ideally. <laughs> and this is actually the way that we 
um, drive our system towards high molecular weight polymer, um, typically by applying vacuum to remove the ethylene gas. So one thing that Dr. Wagner likes to mention is that we can actually prepare unsaturated polyethylene by condensing ethylene, which is kind of counterintuitive, but that's the way that it works. So we can uh, design our monomers so that they lead to the precision placement of functional groups. So if this alpha omega diene is perfectly symmetrical, that will result in precisely spaced functional groups as seen in this figure here. Um, the alternative would be if they were randomly placed, if the functional groups were randomly placed along the backbone, um, we can prepare this too, but that's generally not the type of materials we're interested in. And as I mentioned, the internal olefin bond is left behind. Um, and generally, we go on to fully saturate the backbone. But in some instances, we leave it intact if it is uh, you know, necessary for whatever we're looking at. So we can precisely control the functional group identity in the chain. There's a lot of synthetic work has gone into designing you know, many different types of functionalities. And we can also incorporate the R group into the backbone of the chain. Um, and this can have some nice consequences, uh, particularly if it's a sulfon group, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but it can actually lead to very high melting point polymers, which is an area of my research. Another thing is that we can precisely control the functional group frequency. So we can make them closer together or farther apart. Um, and an excellent review of the chemistry used to prepare symmetric carbon-centered or heteroatom-centered alpha omega dienes is this review here. Um, and I will also mention this at the end of the presentation um, in case you want to take a look further in depth into the, the monomer synthesis. I want to mention now some ADMET polymer melting trends because this is one of the, the kind of quick ways that we can determine um, if something is semi-crystalline or amorphous. So when the R group is pendant to the chain, as in this top case here, as we move the R groups farther and farther apart along the polyethylene backbone, um, the melting point increases. And the reason why is because the R groups are atactic. So they tend to disrupt crystallization, especially when they're close together. So the farther you can space them out, um, the higher the melting point will be because the, the polyethylene segments want to crystallize with each other. Um, a, a unique trend that we've discovered pretty recently is that in some instances, when the R group is a sulfone, for example, um, or incorporated into the chain backbone, it actually increases the melting temperature as you put the R groups closer together. Um, and this is because there's no tacticity in the backbone to disrupt the crystal structure. I just want to point this out because it's going to come into play a little bit later in the presentation when I talk about the secondary structure of precision polymers. A couple of other things to consider for um, ADMET polymerization is the monomer size and monomer purity. So um, you need to choose alpha omega diene monomers that don't form five, six, or seven membered rings um, if they undergo ring closing metastasis. And the reason for this is that once you form these stable ring structures, they don't want to open again. So you're preferentially going to get the ring closing product rather than the desired ADMET products. You need to choose um, dienes that are a little bit longer than this to have successful ADMET polymerization. And also the monomer purity is of utmost importance in ADMET polymerization. Um, the reason why, so if you have a monoene um, contaminating your monomer, what's going to happen is you'll form low, molecu low molecular weight oligomers with um, the monoene on the chain end. And what happens after you, you can't further polymerize this chain end now. Um, and also when the diene doesn't match the desired monomer, you'll cause a loss of precision spacing. So in this case, where your methylene spacer is 2x, and, and then if you have some 2y, um, monomer with of a different length, what will happen is you'll get a random incorporation of those two different um, spacings, and that will cause you to lose precision spacing. And this is really important for achieving different secondary structures, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later on in the talk. Another thing to consider is um, the presence of 1,2 olefin isomerization. So these isomerization events during ADMET polymerization are another cause of loss of precision spacing. The reason why it happens is um, the formation of ruthenium hydride species that look like this. 
So this is a decomposition product of an heterocyclic carbene ligated ruthenium met metathesis catalyst. Um, and this dinuclear hydride species catalyzes 1-2 migration of terminal olefins under the same conditions that metathesis occurs. So you want to avoid forming this ruthenium hydride species because then, for example, this double bond could be moved to here. And when you uh, incorporate that into the admet polymer, what happens is you'll have um, the desired spacing in this case would be where the R groups are eight carbons apart, but you would then have some incorporation of monomer where the R groups are seven, seven uh, carbon atoms apart. So you'll lose your precision spacing. Um, this is the desired admet product where the R group is on every ninth carbon, so eight carbons apart. <clears throat> so that leads me into talking about some catalyst considerations. So we, we choose catalysts that um, can achieve our metathesis chemistry under our desired conditions. Um, early work used Schrock catalysts to perform the admet polymerization. Um, these are really, really wonderful catalysts if you're polymerizing all aliphatic systems. So they have very little one to olefin isomerization, but they are very air and water sensitive. So this is really chemistry that happens in the glove box. Um, and they're also, they don't have very good tolerance to functional groups, but they have beautiful precision if you're working with all aliphatic system. Um, a little bit later on, uh, the Grebs first generation catalyst, which is this structure here with the two phosphine ligands, um, has really become the darling of admet polymerization because it has pretty good tolerance to functional groups. Um, and it also has a relatively low incidence of 1,2 olefin isomerization. So it's, it's pretty easy to handle and it produces very precise polymers under admet polymerization conditions. Um, some other later generation ruthenium catalysts are um, listed here. So these are generally avoided for metathesis, for admet polymerizations um, that are conducted at low temperatures and in solution because there is, um, because of the N heterocyclic carbene ligand on top, they are prone to forming the ruthenium hydride species that can catalyze 1, 2 olefin isomerization. Um, and then same thing with the Grebs third generation catalyst. One thing I want to point out, which is a recent development, is this catalyst, we call it C668. That's um, what it says on the bottle. It's kind of a unique metathesis catalyst. Um, the unique thing about this is that it can do metathesis reactions up to 200 degrees Celsius, which up until very recently um, was impossible without a, a lot, either catalyst degradation or a lot of um, olefin isomerization. In this case, um, you can add a little bit of um, benzoquinone to the reaction, which suppresses the formation of ruthenium hydride, and you can um, get really nice, nicely precise polymers that um, are made at really elevated temperatures. Which brings me now to um, the different polymerization techniques that we use. So first, and by far the most common technique is to perform the admet polymerization in solution. So you can use high boiling point solvents or ionic liquids, which are nice because those substances allow us to apply vacuum to remove the ethylene, which if you remind, remember back to the admet polymerization mechanism, um, removal of ethylene is essential to drive the polymerization in the forward direction towards high molecular weight polymer. It also helps to solvate the catalyst. Um, and there are some instances where we use low boiling point solvents. And in that case, you can remove the ethylene by having a constant argon or nitrogen flow into the solution. Um, a little bit of a downside of this type of technique is that the reaction time is often on the order of days. So you get very nice results, but it takes a long time to get high molecular weight polymer. The second most common approach is a bulk technique. So this means that you simply have the catalyst and your monomer and absolutely no solvent. So this is nice because then you can apply high vacuum to remove the ethylene to drive the reaction forward. Um, the catalyst must be soluble in the monomer to use this technique. Um, and also this technique reduces the probability of forming cyclic oligomers because when you have you know, only bulk monomer around the chain and is more likely to see a monomer unit rather than um, to see the other end of the polymer chain, which is nice. And recently we've been using this technique to prepare high melting point polymers. So 
something above with a melting point of above about 150 degrees Celsius. Um, this is due to recent advance in ruthenium catalyst design. So this C668 catalyst is how we're able to achieve um, high temperature bulk polycondensation. Um, this is what I work on in the Wagner group right now. So I'm specifically interested in synthesizing precision polysulfones. Um, so they'll have a uh, structure looking like this. And we do these under, like I said, absolutely no solvent um, of temperatures up to 200 degrees Celsius and very high vacuum. And then we go on to saturate to get this unsaturated aliphatic polysulfone. And this work is funded by um, the Army Research Office. So we're very grateful to Dewan Pere um, for her funding of this work. Another um, couple of techniques I want to talk about are what I call kind of boutique. They're not used very often, but they are effective um, if you need to use them. First of which is solid state polymerization. Um, this is useful in preparing intractable polymers. Um, and the polymerization primarily happens in the amorphous regions due to that's where there's the highest degree of chain mobility. So in this case, um, we're looking at the synthesis of a polythiophene vinylene. So you add a little bit of ruthenium catalyst um, to it and you generate a pre-polymer, which is really just another word for short molecular weight oligomers. Um, and then at this point, you um, continue heating the sample and sprinkle a little bit more catalyst on top of it um, to continue the metathesis reaction. And the chain mobility in the amorphous regions is actually enough to continue the polymerization to take it up to um, polymeric molecular weight. Also, um, we've done a little bit of work in the Wagner group with microwave assisted polymerizations. Um, the increased power from the microwave had a positive effect on molecular weight and also shortened reaction times, which is very good. All right, so um, those are sort of a summary of the basics of ADMET polymerization. So all of the things that you would need to consider in terms of, you know, reaction design. So, you know, solvent versus bulk, what kind of catalyst, how to design the monomers. Um, and what I want to talk about now is while all that synthetic work was happening to figure out the best conditions of how to, pre how to prepare ADMET polymers, um, at the same time, the Wagner group um, and collaborators were really focused on synthesizing precise materials to get a good idea of how the precise structure affects properties. So what I want to talk about is how two decades of um, careful structure property relationship studies has led to really fundamental understanding of how precision polymers arrange themselves into their secondary structures. So secondary structure is how a polymer is oriented with itself. So for example, in high density polyethylene, like in this figure here, um, the polyethylene segments can um, line up with each other really nicely to form these crystalline areas uh, so that, that it has a highly crystalline secondary structure. And you can do x-ray scattering and a bunch of other techniques on this to determine what's exactly the crystal structure of these crystalline regions. Now, if you introduce a branch, um, a, a carbon branch, every, a, approximately every 20 carbons, um, but not in a precise manner, as in the case of low density polyethylene, what you end up with is a secondary structure that's much more disordered. And the reason for that is because the polymer can't really figure out a way to incorporate those branches into a, a nice regular crystal structure. So what you end up with is the sort of amorphous material. Um, and what the ADMET chemistry developed in the Wagner group has allowed us to do is to precisely place any type of branch we want at almost any spacing apart that we want and study how that impacts the secondary structure. So these figures here on the right are some of are the three different possible configurations of ADMET polymers um, that are achievable precisely due to the fact that we can um, control the spacing. So the first that's possible is a thin crystal, where if you imagine that the black segments are your polyethylene run links and the blue um, dots represent the functionality that's incorporated, um, this thin crystals are basically thin because they only are the thickness of one methylene run length and then the functional group is actually excluded from the crystal structure. In an extended chain conformation or EC, as it will be denoted um, later on in the presentation, 
the functional groups are actually incorporated into the polyethylene crystal. So they have this sort of extended chain structure. And then finally, um, adjacent reentry is this example here where at every instance of the functional group, the polyethylene backbone undergoes a turn. So that way you end up with there are these, you know, these crystallized polyethylene segments and then um, the functionality ends up facing each other into this sort of layered structure. One thing to note, so never trust what a cartoon shows you um, because this cartoon is incomplete. Um, in these two cases, the amorphous regions also exist in these type of polymer systems, but they're just not shown in this cartoon uh, for clarity. All right, so really what I'm gonna get into now is how we have carefully studied um, precision uh, polymer secondary structures and what can we learn or how can we learn to target these nanoscale morphologies to create functional materials? And that's really the state of the art of what we're focusing on now. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what type of systems form thin and extended chain crystals. So this is a really beautiful study um, that was published in 2009 from our group where um, there's a, basically if you go read the paper, there's a really beautiful two-step synthesis to prepare a huge variety of these alkyl substituted uh, precision polymers where um, they're always on every 21st carbon in this green sphere represents the functional group that's located at that carbon. So these are all the different functional groups that were studied. And when the green sphere is a hydrogen, that's simply linear polyethylene. So um, then there was all sorts of other alkyl substitutions that went on. And we used this to uh, then compare the melting point of all these different precision polymers. So when the functionality is a hydrogen, methyl, or ethyl group, um, the melting point is higher than all of the rest of the um, functional groups that you can have. So for hydrogen, it has a melting point of about 135 degrees Celsius, which is what we would expect for linear polyethylene. Um, the melting point is significantly lowered when you put a methyl group on every 21st carbon and then lowered again if you put an ethyl group. And then after that, the melting points stay fairly similar. And the reason for that is because there has been a transition in the secondary structure from an extended chain structure to a thin crystal structure. And the reason for this is that some um, size, the functionality can no longer, it's too big to be incorporated into the crystal structure. So it must be excluded from the crystalline domain. So um, the takeaway from this is that small nonpolar groups can be incorporated into the crystal um, and large nonpolar groups are excluded from the crystal. So this is uh, the first part of our design rules that we think about when we're trying to target these different morphologies. The second system that I want to talk about are what if we now put, keep the um, substituents small, but introduce polarity. So when the functional group is a halide, like fluorine, chlorine, or bromine, or carbonyl, um, we also observe extended chain type crystals because they're small enough to be included into the crystal structure. Um, I have over here a wide angle x-ray scattering um, pattern of different Polymers that are prepared, the polymer structures are here on the left for each trace. So the top one is linear polyethylene, um, which has a well-known orthorhombic type unit cell. So that's just, it's a really symmetric unit cell, um, which is, there's an example of one here where all the vector lengths are equal. And as you incorporate a carbonyl and a fluorine group, you notice that the location of these X-ray scattering peaks don't change a lot. And what that tells us is that they have a similar um, the unit cell is uh, also orthorhombic, um, like linear polyethylene. And once we um, incorporate larger halides like chlorine and bromine, um, the scattering peaks go to lower angles, which means that the, the unit cell is having to increase in dimension in order to accommodate the larger halogen species. So these are still extended chain um, secondary structures, but the unit cell is having to tilt into more triclinic type of character to accommodate the larger atoms. So the takeaway from this work is that small polar groups can still be incorporated into the crystal domain, um, but larger polar groups begin to distort the unit cell. So now we'll consider some large and polar pendant groups. Um, specifically in this case, we're gonna talk about if we have a pendant carboxylic acid on every ninth, 15th, or 21st carbon. 
respectively. So this is the DSC um, curves of three different precision uh, carboxylic acid functionalized polymers. So um, as I noted before, as you sometimes when you put these um, functional groups close together, they disrupt the crystal structure so much that they can't actually crystallize. So when the carboxylic acid is on every 15th or every ninth carbon, we actually see no melting endotherm. So these two materials are completely amorphous. But when we put the carboxylic acid on every 21st carbon, um, we see a nice melting endotherm at about 45 degrees Celsius. So in this work, this was the target um, to look at, okay, now what kind of um, semi-crystalline secondary structure do we find? And this is what we found. So I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, the, uh, a diagram here is an x-ray scattering pattern of P21AA, so carboxylic acid on every 21st carbon, stretched along the direction of the arrow. And what happens when you draw these samples is that the polyethylene segments align with each other. And then you'll notice these two low angle reflections, which at the time were attributed to um, the spacing between acid groups. So um, this suggests that the, the they're oriented 90 degrees to the polyethylene segments um, and they're in a layered conformation. So at the time this work was done in 2007, um, this morph or this secondary structure was assigned based on this x-ray scattering pattern. And the reason why um, this was proposed was because we thought, okay, hydrogen bonding between in-plane neighbors must be stabilizing the crystal structure because despite having you know, the, the carboxylic acids are much bigger than a methyl group or, you know, a small halogen, but um, they must be stabilized by the neighbor hydrogen bonding, <clears throat> which is kind of interesting um, because that led um, the Wagner group and also Karen Winey's group to, at, uh, I think she's at University of Pennsylvania, um, to think, well, okay, we've prepared a lot of precision materials and there's technically three types of possible secondary structures. So where are the adjacent reentry structures? So in 2017, um, they re-examined the, the polymer that I talked about on the previous slide, and they did some molecular dynamic simulations of um, this polymer in both an extended chain conformation as well as an adjacent reentry conformation. So the molecular dynamic simulation suggested that the um, extended chain conformation was lower in potential energy um, but they noted that melt crystallized systems are not in the overall lowest free energy state. So um, more likely they're in a trapped dynamic state. <clears throat> and additionally, um, they simulated some adjacent reentry uh, wide angle X-ray scattering data and compared it to experimental data. So I'll walk you through this X-ray scattering <clears throat> plot. So the black trace here is the experimental wide angle X-ray wide angle X-ray scattering data, and the green line is the total fit. So then they deconvoluted from the total fit um, the amorphous halo, which is this dashed gray line here, as well as the solid gray, which is the crystalline peak. And when you compare this crystalline peak to the simulated structure factor for um, an adjacent reentry type structure, which is this blue curve here, and an extended chain structure factor, which is this red curve here, um, the adjacent reentry data matches almost perfectly, which really points to um, the fact that it's more likely an adjacent reentry type of structure than extended chain. Um, and this was also supported in this work by Raman spectroscopy data. So after this work, <clears throat> it was pretty much um, confirmed that the true morphology of the P21AA polymer is really an adjacent reentry um, type of secondary structure. So this has really exciting implications because you can imagine how now you have these channels that are enriched with, um, if you can get them into this confirmation, whatever functionality you desire. So one thing that we desire to look at is um, precision sulfonated polyethylene. So this type of structure here. So I wanna point out right now um, a quick chemistry note, because this looks like a simple structure, but in reality, this was not an easy polymer to prepare. So for years, this type of um, precision sulfonated polyethylene was sought, but the problem really ended up in deprotection of sulfonate ester groups. So what would happen is you would get incomplete deprotection of the sulfonic esters, and then what you have now is an imprecise polymer, because the 
tenant groups are a mixture of um, the esters and the sulfonic acid. So that's no good for um, studying precision polymers. <clears throat> and Dr. Taylor Gaines, who's a, um, a past graduate student in the Wagner group, in the Wagner group came up with a new sulfonic ester deprotection strategy, which is really um, anti-intuitive to most general or most uh, organic chemists because we're always trained that um, deprotection chemistry should happen in a homogeneous mixture. So what he did, which was really clever, was he took the protected sulfonic ester and floated it on top of a solution of wet DMSO and then threw in a couple of tablets of sodium hydroxide and um, left it for days. So this is what we call in the Wagner group beach chemistry because you set it up and then you go to the beach. <laughs> and when you come back, you see um, what happened. So in this case, what happened was um, he came back to a completely homogeneous mixture of the deprotected sulfonic um, the sulfonate polymer in DMSO. And the reason for this is that as the sulfonic esters become hydrolyzed to this form, um, the polymer became more and more soluble in the DMSO. So as the polymer becomes more soluble, that gives access to more um, sulfonic esters that can be deprotected. So it's sort of like a self-amplifying type of system where at the end um, you get quantitative deprotection of the sulfonic uh, sulfonate groups. So this, if you go to read this in the literature, it's in this paper here, um, you'll actually see that it was changed to using sodium ethoxide and ethanol. Um, and th the reason for this was mainly because um, the DMSO was a little bit difficult to remove after deprotection. So this um, chemistry is really what enabled the um, functional polymer that I'm going to talk about next, which is using this um, precisely sulfonated polyethylene to prepare um, ion transport membranes. So here we have a sulfonic acid group, which replaces the carboxylic acid group that I talked about previously, but they're the same spacing apart. Um, they're every 21st carbon or 20 carbons apart. And uh, they achieve the same adjacent reentry type secondary structure, which forms these hydrosco hygroscopic channels enriched with sulfonic groups. Um, and sulfonic acids are common functional groups in ion transport membranes because they are so hydroscop hydroscopic. So what they did then was compare this material to um, uh, the benchmark ion transport material, which is napheon. So this is kind of a general chemical structure of napheon. It's a fluorinated polymer um, that has this um, sulfonate group on the end. And the secondary structure of napheon is actually pretty widely debated even still, but generally um, what we think in the scientific community is that there's these pores that are decorated with the, um, the SO3 minus groups that are connected by a system of very small channels. And then so it, the, the ions have to take quite a torturous path um, to migrate their way through these type of um, disordered membranes, where as the system that we're looking at is now highly ordered um, and decorated with these well-defined channels containing the sulfonic acid groups. So in this work, um, they compared, uh, which our group and the Winey group compared Napheon 117 with um, the P21SA polymer at a different, at a range of relative humidities. So um, at relative humidities above 60%, the ion conductivity was right on par with um, Napheon, and this is the first reported instance of such proton transport in a polyethylene-based crystalline structure. So this was a really big achievement um, in using the secondary structure of a precision polymer to prepare something that can do some work for us. Um, one thing to note about this work is that uh, the direction of the channels was not biased in any way. So this was just simply a melt crystallized sample, um, and modeling studies from this uh, work suggested that further ordering of the nanoscopic channels may further enhance the conductivity um, by decreasing the torturosity that um, the ions have to go through to reach the other side of the membrane. So I want to kind of come to an end by summarizing some of the secondary structure trends that have evolved from, you know, over two and a half decades of careful study of uh, secondary structures. So thin crystals generally are formed by uh, precision polymers with bulky nonpolar substituents um, with a methylene run length uh, greater than 20. Extended chains 
are formed when small polar substituents are on the chain, and you can form these with smaller methylene ring links. And finally, um, adjacent reentry, which is kind of the most exciting out of the ones that we've talked about, um, are where you have a large polar substituent. Um, and really kind of the key is that they're about 21, every 21 carbons. Um, this has sort of been the magic number for certainly carboxylic acids and sulfonic acids, and also hydrogen bonding um, can help form these structures. I also want to mention some other notable admet polymer work that's been done outside of our research group. So um, definitely conjugated polymers benefit greatly from admet polymerization uh, due to the fact that the metastasis polymerization leaves behind an olefin, which can link to pi systems together. So you have this really long conjugated system. Um, this, in this case here, you have a polythiophene vinylene. Um, there's other types of uh, aromatic systems that have been explored. And there's also been a lot of work done in sustainably derived admet monomers and polymers. So, um, you know, forming these precision polyethers and also polyesters. And finally, um, one of my favorite papers from recent years um, is using admet polymerization to prepare biomimetic polymers. In this case, um, this admet polymer can form these really long fibrils that sort of resemble um, DNA structure. So I, I really like that paper a lot. Um, and if you're interested in some further reading, we have some very nice reviews in the Wagner group in particular. Um, me and myself and Giovanni Rojas and Dr. Wagner are currently finishing up uh, what we think is a nice review. And there's also some other recent ones that are um, available already published. And also I really recommend um, the Handbook of Metathesis published in 2015, which has a chapter on AdMet, but it also has a lot of other chapters on um, all the different types of uh, olefin metathesis that you might want to read about. <clears throat> and I want to bring this seminar to an end by thanking a couple of really important people. Um, first of all is my postdoc advisor, Dr. Ken Wagner, who um, is absolutely phenomenal mentor, amazing boss, and also uh, Brent Summerlin for helping me to organize this seminar. And he's sort of our our leader in the Butler Laboratory, and also all of my co-workers in the Butler Laboratory. It's seriously a really special place to work. And um, we like to say that we're not really eight different research groups. We're kind of one big research group in the Polar, Butler Palmer Lab, which is really fun because I've gotten to know a lot more people than if I would just work in one research group. Um, also the Florida Department, the University of Florida, Florida Department of Chemistry and Army Research Office for um, funding my work that I work on in the Wagner Group. And with that, I'll be very happy to take your questions and thank you for joining me. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. I'm sure we're all applauding uh, mm -hmm. on our own ends here. Um, hopefully you're uh, willing to entertain some questions. So if, if, yeah. if you have a question, um, please just go to the participants list and scroll to the bottom and you should be able to uh, raise your hand um, and we can recognize you. Michael yes, Sims. I see one. Uh, yeah, Michael, Michael Sims, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great talk, Julia. This was really informative. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question was about that last system you showed of the um, polyethylene with the precise carboxylic acids and uh, sulfonic acid groups. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any studies on what the, like the large scale, the bulk morphology of the uh, ion containing channels is and the, um, the crystallized polyethylene segments? Um, the wax data you show was really convincing of the structure of the crystallites themselves. Do you know what the, the morphology on the scale of you know, the larger sample is? Like, is it a disordered morphology? Are the um, channels so continuous? No, so in that work, um, it was a disordered morphology. So those crystallites would have been oriented in all different orientations. Um, and I think that's really what makes that data exciting. So despite that, you know, disordered orientation of the semi-crystalline regions, um, that material still matched the conductivity of uh, the nafion membrane. So if you were to perhaps epitaxially orient those channels, it might be even better. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And just to follow it up real quick, do you think um, if you change the size of the ethylene 
uh, spacer between the sulfonic acid groups? Do you think that might affect the uh, long range morphology at all? Um, I'm not sure if it would affect the long range morphology, but I suspect that you might not get the, ad the adjacent reentry secondary structure that you're after. Um, so there's like a lot of other literature that suggests that having the functional groups 21 carbons apart exactly is really a key factor to achieving that morphology. Um, and the way that I've heard, um, particularly Karen Whiney explain it, is that that is just the exact length that the polyethylene segment needs to, um, number one, crystallize with itself and then make that turn to form those sulfonic uh, uh, channels. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like we have another question from uh, from Steve Miller. Steve, hi Julia, uh, nice presentation. I saw much of it. I was finishing my two and a half hour re review session for my upcoming exam, um, but nice work. So what I've what I think I've noticed <clears throat> about the carboxylic acid pendant polymers, it's it's one of the few functional groups that is potentially you know, you could connect, right? You could do some chemistry and connect the two. Have you thought about using either a diol, possibly anhydride chemistry, right, to make anhydrides? Is there a way that you could now study what I would call, um, you know, uh, precision cross-linking, right? So you could, you could cross-link the carboxylic acids in a way that might, you know, it's not gonna be perfect. You're gonna get some intramolecular cross-linking, but you might also be able to get some intermolecular cross-linking with certain kinds of diols, for example, it might be the first thing to try. I don't know if a strategy like that, at least conducted to some degree, could help to stabilize your structures, right? So that it would, it would, it would keep them together to a greater degree and may increase, uh, probably decrease their processability, but would increase, you know, maybe some of the, the temperatures at which these things could be used. Can you do chemistry on these in a, in a prescribed way? Um, so I'm not sure about the carboxylic acid system because those carboxylic acids are really close together. So I think if you were to try to get something in there to do that in hydride chemistry, that would kind of necessitate that you break up that crystal. Disrupt it. Um, maybe I with enough that, water. Yeah, maybe. maybe so that's maybe the, not the anhydride chemistry, but maybe if you broke it up with water and maybe reacted it with diamines or something that would be pretty reactive relative to a medium in which you might want to dissolve it like water. Yeah, that's the exact thing I was going to mention is that particularly in the sulfonic acid structures, if you put those in 100% relative humidity, those channels increase like a few nanometers, like a lot. So I think that would definitely be the ticket to um, kind of mitigating that, that close range um, and giving it some room to react. Okay. All right. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. That's a good idea. So I see we have another question from uh, Kitty Williams. Ken, did you want to add something to that question or did you have a separate question? How did I... oh, you're, you're muted, Ken. Okay, yeah. How's that? Okay. Good. Okay, I think that's a really nice thought, Steve. We haven't pursued that at all, frankly, and I think it's a good idea uh, how to go about it. I think you put right on the easy way to do it plus water. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, I think the next question is to uh, Kitty Williams. If you're talking, Dr. Williams, we can't hear you. All right. Let's. Uh, in the meantime, let's jump to, I think, Robert's iPad. Bob, is that is that you? Yep, that's me. Go ahead, Bob. All right, go ahead. So, so, this, uh, so this being able to add meta 200 degrees is, uh, is really interesting. So, uh, so how much isomerization do you see in pushing it to really high temperatures and high conversions? That's a really good question. Um, if we add about four mole per percent of benzoquinone, we can limit isomerization to about 10%, um, which in our, okay. system, in our systems, we've defined that as a tolerable level because um, in DSC, we can still see high melting points, which indicates to us that we're not really losing um, too much of the precision. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, looks like uh, maybe Jersey. Hi, uh, this is Jersey Clausen. Uh, Julia, very, very nice talk, beautiful overview of, of the element catalysis um, and chemistry. I was curious, you mentioned in, in 2007, uh, Ken's group published a paper on precision uh, ethylene acrylate copolymers. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, acrylate copolymers commercially are used to commercial, they are commercially available, period. And then they can be ionized to form ionomers. And I know that some of the work that you guys did with Karen on sulfonates, but I was wondering, I just don't remember, if you could refresh my memory, did you guys publish any work on um, ethylene or you know acrylate copolymers themselves which with with um, that, that were transformed into ionomers yes so that work was done I think primarily by Kate Oper um, and those structures um, can be formed into beautiful uh, polymer single crystals uh, grown from solutions so okay. that is definitely something that's a really big area actually um, I didn't mention it because I was a little bit I thought it would be a little bit short for time, um, but I can send mm -hmm. you those references because I, Dr. Reiner, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kate Over did some beautiful work in that area. Well, she certainly did. She was at the Ponce Experimental Station when she left us and still with, well, Dow now, I guess you would say. So Jersey, perhaps you can mm -hmm. get in touch with Kate and talk about it further. Okay, what is her last name? It's Oper, O-P-P-E-R. Right, and she published quite a bit. She also spent a lot of time over in Mainz at the Max Planck Institute. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see here. Do, do we have? Um, okay, uh, Nick, Nicholas, Nicholas Stretch. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much. That was a very nice uh, summary over the um, the atmet field or introduction to the atmet field. Um, I've got two questions, one um, a little bit uh, without the burden of knowledge. Um, can you also do H-type monomers, so not dienes, but tetraenes, and get something sort of like letter-type polymers? Um, I think in that case, you would get, oh, so yes, in some sense, but you would really end up with a cross-linked system, I think, if you had a, a tetra. Uh, alkene. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the other thing is um, regarding to the uh, first part of your talk, um, you had these aliphatic side chains and the main property you were looking at was a melting point. Mm -hmm. Are there any other physical properties that significantly changed? For example, when you start incorporating lots of butyl hexyl side chains, you could also think of something that gets a little bit more plastomeric. Yeah, so there is actually a really nice paper. I can't remember the journal now, but it's from 2009, um, where if you precisely incorporate a hexyl branch, for example, so it's sort of something that looks like a linear low density polyethylene, but in a precise fashion, um, that work showed that the precision spacing of what would be a butyl branch lowered the distribution of lamellar thickness, and that was positively correlated to um, the tensile properties of that material. So it's kind of a nuanced uh, change in physical properties, but yeah, that's definitely something that was observed as a result of the precision. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like we have a question from uh, Richard Turner. Yes, Julia, Richard Turner in Blacksburg. Uh, thanks, I really enjoyed that. And thanks for Ken for remembering me and inviting me. Uh, like Ken, I am spent a lot of time doing polyesters and we used uh, solid state polymerizations for uh, semi-crystalline polyesters to get high molecular weight without uh, forcing really high temperatures, uh, which caused a lot of degradation and so forth. Uh, I was very interested in your solid state polymerizations. Unfortunately, my daughter called right in the middle of that and I had to step out. But have you done a, a polysulfone, the polysulfones at high temperature, crystallize those at some low molecular weight and, and then drive them to high molecular weight, uh, you know, in the solid state? Uh, 
We have not tried that with the polysulfones. Um, my work primarily in the high, you know, doing the, the bulk polymerization at high temperatures with polysulfones. I've actually been using um, a reactor with a mechanical stir to try to keep um, agitating the, the polymer mixture, but definitely I think um, it would also be possible to do a solid state, um, you know, to in, increase the molecular weight at, after it's been semi-crystallized. Yeah, after, as the melt viscosity builds up, it gets harder to get the, you know, the, uh... You know, <laughs> in, in my case, yeah, in my case, once uh, I've noticed that once the viscosity builds up, which in my case happens after just a few minutes, it's really difficult to keep removing the ethylene, um, which in the case of admit is how you increase your molecular weight. So that's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Um, okay, I think, uh, Ken, did you want to add something to that before we go to Mark's question? And, and if so, don't forget to unmute. Nope, we can't hear you. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, Richard, it's Gator to Gator. Uh, for everyone, Richard and I were in grad school together, so we've known each other a long time. And I, I feel rather certain it would work for cell phones like it does with polyesters. There's no reason why it shouldn't, because there's an amorphous phase of these polysulfones, which is there. And that's where the chemistry would happen, of course. It may be easy to try, and it's something we ought to try, given the time to do it. Because you're right, it's the way to get high molecular weights. Finally, I might say that Julia has managed to get the highest molecular weight ever in these polysulfones. The reactions don't take days, they take three hours just like polyester, there's no difference. All right, I think uh, we can jump to uh, the question from Mark Kilmeyer. Leah, thanks so much for your uh, presentation. I um, noticed in a couple examples that you used, um, uh, you showed examples of using, instead of a terminal olefin, an internal olefin, and then like in the, the young chin paper, removing but uh, butene instead of ethylene. Mm -hmm. In your experience, have you found more uh, uh, stability in the catalyst if you avoid the ruthenium kind of methylidine um, intermediate, or have you looked much at using butene as the, the condensation product? I personally have not looked a lot, um, but I do know that ethylene, unless you get rid of it and it sticks around, it poisons the catalyst. So I definitely think that's a good point that if your condensate is butylene, um, you might avoid some of that formation um, of degradation species. So that's a good point. Yeah, I had a second uh, question for you. You mentioned at the end that Professor Agner was a um, wonderful boss and an outstanding mentor. I, I can confirm that he was an outstanding mentor and wonderful boss over uh, in the late 80s as well. So are you suggesting he's done that for more than three decades? I think I am suggesting that, yeah. Okay, I'm just confirming. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I have to remark on that. Uh, Mark, you're making me seem old. Why are you doing that? Yes, some things are true, Ken, yes. <clears throat> it's okay to be old. All right, I think we have another, another question from uh, Michael Sims. Hi, Julia. One more question. Uh, Mark Hillmeyer's participation got me thinking along the lines of uh, sustainable polymers, and I was curious, you showed an example of where you can incorporate a functional group into the chain mm -hmm. of the polymer. So has anybody looked at possibly incorporating cleavable functional groups into admet synthesized polyethylene? And that way you might be able to, you know, with sufficiently long ethylene spacer, uh, retain some of the good properties of polyethylene while also having degradability. Yes, so the short answer to your question is yes. The semi-longer question, or semi-longer answer to your question is um, with respect to the long, like, methylene spacer length, kind of no. So there's actually a really nice paper. Now I can't remember the author, but basically they had this uh, moiety that degraded into acrolin, um, which is a biocide, but that's kind of beside the point. The point was that um, if you put a drop of like a strong acid, like uh, I think it, they used hydroiodic acid in the paper I'm thinking of, um, 
yeah, so they had like these little ester groups along that they could then cleave with the acid. And then one of the byproducts of the cleavage was a strong acid. So it was, they called it chain amplifying or a self amplifying chain shattering um, degradation, which was pretty interesting. And I can send you that paper if you're interested. Okay. Probably the best example that I can think of. Okay, great. All right, any, any other questions out there? Maybe I can just end up with uh, one final question, Julia, since uh, many people here may not know, but you are launching your own career, um, your own independent career at the Naval Academy uh, in the fall. So congratulations um, to, to that. Um, we're all definitely very proud of you here. Um, as you look forward, and at least to within the area of ADMET, what are the biggest challenges you see that are remaining? You know, what are the things that we need to, to really tackle now? I think one of the main things we need to tackle, um, which is something that I'm actually working on currently in the Wagner Group, is being able to prepare these materials on a multigram scale. So we do a lot of fancy work, um, particularly the precision sulfonic acid work on hundreds of milligrams of material, but to really test these things in devices now that we understand the design parameters that go into targeting these morphologies. Um, the key is going to be preparing them on a scale to truly test them um, in devices. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have uh, another comment here from uh, from Ken. Ken, go ahead. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, Julie is exactly right. The, the focus at the moment is on applications and we can't discuss exactly which ones we have started, but we have some really promising data on viable applications based on Julia's work in polysulfones, given that they're high melters. So we'll get to that in the coming months in the next year or so and be able to tell people what's going on. We can't discuss it right now, but I think you'll find the future looks pretty interesting in this field. Perfect.